It is extremely important for our democracy to function that ordinary citizens understand the key issues and basic theories of economics. Now, if you ask uh, people who haven't studied economics, what is economics? The usual answer will be, well, it must be the study of the economy. You know, chemistry is study of chemicals, biology is study of living things. So economics must be the study of the economy. That would be a commonsensical answer, but interestingly, that would be wrong, at least according to the most popular economics books of our time. Look at these titles, you know, in the middle there's Free Economics, which is probably the best-selling economics book ever, other than textbooks. And they claim that, that they are looking at the hidden side of everything. The Logic of Life, the second book by Tim Harford, the famous Financial Times journalist of the undercover economist fame, he subtitled his book also as New Economics of Everything. And there is Professor Robert Frank uh, from Cornell University in America, who is much more modest because he says why economics explains almost everything, not literally everything. But you can see from this that economists these days claim that they can actually explain everything. But this is some claim coming from people who have basically messed up what other people think is their main job, namely explaining the economy and keeping it prosperous stable and innovative. Total turmoil in Wall Street. We have seen the worst financial and economic crisis since the Great Depression in the 1920s, back in 2007 and 2008. Now, before this happened, you know, economists are making big claims. You know, Robert Lucas, the famous uh, Chicago economist, in his presidential address of the American Economic Association in 2003, declared that economics has solved the problem of preventing recessions. Yeah? This is what financial Armageddon looks like. Red screens that scream sell, sell, sell. Stock markets around the world collapsed today. In Britain, the stock market fell sharply by 5%. The markets now believe that we are on the cusp of a sharp and prolonged recession. Fears for the ripple effect that could engulf the world economy. Well, only <laughs> four or five years later to see the biggest recession since uh, the Second World War. You know, people are making all kinds of claims that we have solved the world's problem. Ben Bernanke, the former professor of Princeton and former chairman of the Federal Reserve Board, the American Central Bank, talked about the great moderation. Now we have basically abolished the business cycle. You know? Everything is going along nicely, moderately, you know, maybe a slight fluctuation, but we have basically reached a state of nirvana. Well, he didn't use the term, but uh, that was uh, the message. Huh? So given this, uh, you would uh, say that economists seem to have a case of megalomania. Huh? You know, these are people who cannot even explain what they are supposed to do. And then they come out and say, oh, by the way, we can explain everything else. Huh? This is a very particular form of megalomania because it's uh, not baseless. I mean, it has a methodological foundation, this particular form of megalomania, claiming that economists can explain everything. Lionel Robbins, a leading British economist, defines economics as a science which uh, studies human behavior as a relationship between ends and scarce means, which have alternative uses, and this is the definition of economics that most economists, namely economists who belong to the dominant neoclassical school, have defined economics as. All other subjects define themselves with reference to the subject matter of study. But somehow economics is defined by its analytical methodology rather than its substance, its subject matter. That is the study of the economy. How we produce things, how we distribute the income that uh, come out of that uh, production process, and how we exchange and consume things. This uh, should be the central uh, subject of economics, not how, you know, the, as uh, Free Economics uh, talks about, uh, American uh, school teachers cheat in uh, student assessment, how Japanese sumo wrestlers that, uh, behave rationally despite their stupid looks, and stuff like that. Now, I'm not saying that those uh, the observations are totally irrelevant. I mean, they give you some insight to 
human behavior. But that is uh, not uh, the, the main subject of economics. And applying rational choice theory outside the economy actually gives you a very distorted view of human nature and human society. One important consequence of uh, defining economics in terms of its uh, analytical methodology is to make uh, economists, that is a dominant neoclassical school, believe that there's only one right way of doing economics. Eh? But there are many different schools of economics. There are at least nine main schools of economics and several more if you count the smaller schools or the split bigger schools into sub-schools. And I have actually highlighted three of them in bold because these are all economic theories that support free market uh, policies. But they all do that in different ways. Neoclassical economics does this on the basis of individualist approach based on the, the understanding that uh, human beings are rational and selfish. Insofar as uh, neoclassical economists uh, advocate uh, free market policy, and I'm saying uh, insofar as because uh, there are some neoclassical economists like Joseph Stiglitz and Paul Krugman who would be quite uh, willing to support a wide range of uh, government interventions based on the, the theories of market failure. But insofar as uh, neoclassical economists support uh, free market policy, their position is, look, people know what they are doing, so just leave them alone. Yeah? That's the best uh, the policy. Now, the classical school, the school of Adam Smith and uh, David Ricardo, also advocated the free market policy, but they did it on the basis of a very different economic theory. Because uh, the classical economic theory was based on class analysis. Of course, there was some discussion of individuals and freedom and that kind of thing, but that was more at the level of uh, political rhetoric. The central analytical uh, construct was based on this notion that the society and the economy is made up of uh, three different classes, all with uh, different uh, objectives and behavior. So it is uh, the capitalist class, the working class, and the landlord class. The workers basically get subsistence wage. Yeah? They are given only just enough to survive. Yeah? So they will consume everything they are given. The landlords have surplus, but uh, they are unproductive class, and uh, they would uh, the waste their money on the luxury consumption like you know, hunting lodge and uh, servants and so on. And the capitalists are the people who invest and make uh, the economy grow. So you should maximize its surplus that goes to the uh, capitalist class. Yeah? So that's a very different theory of uh, why free market policy is good. Yeah? The third uh, free market school, uh, probably the most ardent uh, supporters of free market, is the so-called Austrian school, represented by people like uh, von Hayek and von Mises. The Austrian school supports free market far more strongly than the classical or the neoclassical school, but the way they do it is yet again different. Because the Austrian argument is that human rationality is limited. We can only understand what is immediately around us. That limited knowledge gets synthesized by the market mechanism, and that's why free market is great. But when they say that the government shouldn't intervene, it's not because the individuals know better. It's because uh, governments uh, doesn't know better. Eh? So when the, the world is uncertain, our rationality is limited, how dare you, the government, presume that you know better than the individuals? Eh? So that's a very different argument from the neoclassical defense, which is that everyone knows what is going on, so leave them alone. Eh? Now, this is just uh, one illustration, but basically what I'm trying to say is that there are many different ways of theorizing about the economy. I argue that uh, we should also let these schools work together because the world is very complex and no single theory can explain it. And to talk about this, I refer to what I call the Singapore problem or life is stranger than fiction. Now, when you read about Singapore in standard textbooks or the financial press like the Wall Street Journal or the Economist magazine, you will only hear about this uh, free trade policy and its welcoming attitude towards uh, foreign investors. But you will never be told that 90% of land in Singapore is owned by the government. You will never be told that 85% of housing 
is provided by government-owned housing corporation. A staggering 22% of GDP is produced by state-owned enterprises, including the famous Singapore Airlines. I mean, that 22% outside the oil economy, this is uh, literally the highest uh, ratio. So I often put it to my uh, graduate students, give me one economic theory. doesn't matter what it is, neoclassical, Keynesian, Marxist, that can single-handedly explain Singapore. I dare say there is no such theory. Now, despite this uh, inherently pluralistic nature of uh, economics, most economists today belonging to the neoclassical school believe that economics is a science in which there's an objective way of deciding what is right and what is wrong. So they often dismiss other schools for being unscientific. Basically, what this neoclassical school that emerged in the late 19th century has pursued is to turn a subject which in the beginning used to be called political economy into a science called economics. You know, people used to be more honest in the old days. You know, in the old days, uh, no country had the Ministry of Defense. Yeah? They were all called Ministry of War. Yeah? So that uh, people <laughs> call economics political economy acutely aware that this is uh, based on yeah, power struggle between different classes. Yeah? It's that uh, it involves uh, government intervention. We'll go back to that uh, later. And called the political economy in the late uh, 19th century, a bunch of economists that uh, called neoclassical economists came along and said, no, no, we have to turn this into a science. Eh? Get rid of uh, the subjective value judgments like ethics and politics. Eh? We have to turn it into science. And they succeeded in renaming the subject from political economy into economics. <laughs> 